I'm delighted to welcome to the stage an icon, not only in leadership and management, but technology, inclusivity, and somebody whose breadth and depth of knowledge is absolutely inspiring. She'll forever be remembered as the founder of lastminute.com, but since then she's gone on to so many other achievements, they're too numerous to name. I do love, though, that she founded the karaoke bar. Um, but suffice to say, she remains every bit as relevant as a role model today as she was back in her days as a tech entrepreneur. Please welcome to the stage the president of the British Chambers of Commerce, Baroness Martha Lane Fox. Thank you. Well, that was quite an intro. You may have not realized you were actually going to see an extinct species this morning. You may have not realized you're going to see an icon either. That's definitely not true. But you might not be aware that you're actually looking at something that died off this planet decades ago, apparently. I was walking down the street the other day and someone came up to me and said, I know who you are. And I thought, oh, I've obviously done something uh, relevant recently. Yes, they said, you're that, you're, their brain was kind of whirring. Who is this person? Is this? You're that dot com dinosaur. I was like, oh my God. I was 50 this year, but that did feel quite brutal. Anyway, it's, it's really nice to be with you. I'm also kind of ashamed hearing that introduction because there's, I've never had any formal training in anything and have ended up having to do some quite uh, intense management in complex situations. So while I respect everything that the CMI does and I wish you all well on your own personal journeys, it is also possible to have a very strange and kind of uh, privileged career without any formal training at all. So what I wanted to reveal to you this morning is how I try and think about the world right now. You know, I've been very, very lucky to have done some strange things in my life. We started lastminute.com when I was 25, right? Knew nothing. Had this insane roller coaster of a journey. It was a bit like being in a pop band where you have this massive hit, incredibly famous for a short period of time and then over. And then my life took, as you can see, a very different turn. I spent a extremely long time in hospital, two years while I was recovering from a catastrophic car accident, then went on to do some things in the public sector and all kinds of um, different bores and things uh, in the last decade. And I don't mention that to sound grand. I mention it because I've reflected a lot over the last 25 years about what I want to do. I've had that privilege to be able to say, these are the active things I want to get involved in. And sometimes it can just feel overwhelming, can't it? So much important um, and somewhat existential changes happening right now. The climate catastrophe, huge demographic shifts, let alone something I'm meant to understand, which I really don't because it's kind of impossible to keep up with, which is the dramatic shifting pace of technology. So I try and sort out how I think about things and uh, what's important with these three questions, which I thought I'd share with you. But please don't share them too widely, otherwise I'm not going to look very clever anymore. So the first thing I always try and think about is, is this something really worth working on? Is this a business that is contributing to the world? Is this a business that is changing something? Is this an organization that is trying to improve humankind? And that may sound like a simple kind of inflection point, but sometimes it's very hard to work through actually. But it's very important, particularly, you know, my background is predominantly technology. And sometimes I scream when I'm reading the latest piece of technology news as another piece of CRM software has got funding. I was like, okay, that's fine. And if you work in CRM software, all power to you. But right now, that's not what we need to change the world. We need big ideas to help us battle through the next decades. So that's the first thing I always try and think about. What is this problem we're trying to solve? Am I going to look back in 10 years' time and think, yeah, that was something I'm proud to have put my name to have tried to contribute to in a small way? Now, I can't see the 2,000 of you online, but I'm sure you're a very trustworthy bunch. So I'm going to tell you about this in real time, right? I was on the board of Twitter until last October. I chaired the compensation committee. I chaired the transaction committee. I chaired the nomination governance committee. I was really at the heart of all the chaos that was going on. And I wanted to go on the board of Twitter because I loved the product when I joined five, six years ago. I thought it was complex. It was trying to do the right thing. I liked the people. I liked the openness. It wasn't Facebook. It's not closed. It's open. And then the chaos of the last year happened, right? 
And that was quite a difficult judgment call, right? Because you can often make a decision to do something, back to my first question, because you feel like it's trying to move the world on, it's trying to contribute to something in a positive way. And then you're suddenly in a different kind of situation. And as a director of that company, our only decision was, was this the right thing to do for shareholders? Should we sell this company for the shareholders? That was your responsibility. That was my fiduciary duty. That was what was a kind of clarifying principle, but it wasn't why I joined the board. So. I give you that as an example because, you know, I didn't sit thinking, yes, I must sell a company to Elon Musk. No one woke up thinking that that was what their career at Twitter was going to end like. We'd chosen it because we believed Twitter was doing something important in the world. So I don't for one minute think that that decision about, is this something I want to get involved in? Is this a product I want to create? Is this a bit of the organization I want to work on? Is this a project I like? Is an easy decision. Sometimes you can make something over here and end up over there. But that's the first kind of thing I try and vector my life with. The second one is, are we using the tools of the modern age to make this piece of work or this project or this company go better? And this is something I've really tried to work on hard in the last decade. Clearly, we are living through an enormous technological shift again, right? If I think back to my career over the last 25 years, I first started in a strategy consulting company where we were looking at media and telecoms businesses and helping them think about the internet. I was 21, I knew nothing. I got sent around the world to benchmark this famous thing. Do you remember it? The information superhighway. And that was the thing we were all going to be charging down. And then the internet came along, e-commerce came along, social media came along, the iPhone came along, all of the things that have been these inflection points. And we're at another one right now with this incredible, extreme rapidity of the generative AI revolution. I'm not given to hyperbole, despite what you might think. I actually quite try and see a kind of reasoned and balanced view through things. I don't ever believe it's going to be terrible. I don't ever believe it's going to change the world for the better completely. There's always a middle ground. But right now, this process of change feels to me another very fundamental shift taking away all the headlines, the hype about whether we're all heading towards the singularity and I'm going to be replaced by a computer, probably do a better job at most things. I actually think all of us have a responsibility right now to really deeply think about our work, how we interrelate to this new wave of tech. So when I say make sure we're using the tools of the modern age, I think we still, in this country, are kind of built on systems that were invented in 1823, not 2023. And if we are going to really survive into the next decade and the next two decades and do it with purpose and clarity and inclusion, we need to use the tools of the modern age and we all need to use them. And we need to make sure that the digitally excluded, which is still a significant number of people in this country are included, but we also need to make sure that everyone has as much understanding of what's happening as possible. And the good news is it's never really been easier. I'm sure everyone here has played with ChatGPT, but I urge you to keep playing because it is changing every single week. And not just the um, open AI platforms, but all of the applications that are being put on top of it. You know, last week I thought, well, I better really do this because I'm talking about it all the time. So I sat down and in 45 minutes, I had made a website for myself, a, a, a one I was never going to share with the world just as a kind of test. I put in some parameters, responsible business, you know, society, inclusion, women, I can't remember all those different things. And it came up with a website. And then I turned a whole bunch of articles I've been writing recently into podcasts using my own voice in 45 minutes. So I urge you to take really considerable care and attention to play with this stuff. It's never been easier and it's never been more important. So am I working on things that matter? Do I feel that? Am I using the tools of the modern age? Am I really challenging myself to think about how we organize? Not because I think everything should be digital, quite the opposite, but because we are living in a world where everything that can be digitized will be digitized. So therefore we have to take it seriously and we have to organize our organizations around technology, not just our organizations, our country. But the final piece, and I think this is probably the most relevant for your um, incredible conference here today, is around have we got the right people in the room? And this to me is such a fundamental question. I personally don't want to be in places anymore where I'm the only person that looks and feels like me. But still too often I find that I am. I was talking at a security conference recently. I know, right? I mean, that was quite peculiar. There were a lot of generals in the room and I was the only woman in a room of more people than this. And I made some remarks about how the internet was changing everything. We should pay attention. It's probably gonna be a young Chinese woman that takes down our country, not the traditional generals. I was slightly poking them with my stick. 
I sat down and I said to the general sitting next to me, God, it's really depressing that I'm the only woman in this room. And he looked at me, and this was in 2020, and said, but it's not a very girly subject. <laughs> that went well. <laughs> and I don't mention that. I mean, we've all got stories, right? Everyone in this room and all the people watching will have stories. But I mention it because we still need to make sure that the right people are in the room, women, people of color, women, people with disabilities, people with neurodiversity, whatever the different categories of people that we need to include, need to be in that room talking about our future security. And that is just one example, right? We could say that across every single dynamic bit of our economy, sectors, everything. And it's still not happening rapidly enough. It really matters. What I try and challenge myself to do is think about bringing in somebody who doesn't look like me to the conversations that I'm having. You know, I'm very lucky to mentor some young women, work with an incredible organization that you know, helps young migrants, some organizations that help young women in some refugee camps across the continent of Africa. You know, I feel my privilege very heavily, and I'm not just talking about privilege in the, the sense that it's been talked about in the last year or so. I mean, just the incredible experience that I've had over the last couple of decades. So we all need to do the same. We need to look into our meetings and say, have we really got the best representation in this meeting? Are we really pushing ourselves to bring younger voices, different voices, diverse voices? It's so fundamental. To go back to a Twitter for a second, this was something that I really respected. Jack, who was one of the founders of Twitter, was a complicated kind of person. I don't know if you've seen him. He looks a bit like a kind of uh, incredible guru. It was not easy in many ways, but one thing he cared very deeply about was making Twitter a place that people felt very comfortable to work from all backgrounds. It wasn't universally um, achieved, but it was achieved in many aspects of the business. I'm sure many people here are aware of Black Twitter that became a very, very powerful uh, activist social tool. Um, many, many people around the world were using hashtag Black Twitter and forming these communities. And that was partly because Jack brought different communities into the room at the very senior management level and product design level. Very different to an example I've used a lot, but is so incredibly powerful, which is when Apple were designing their health tool. They released this wall of singing, dancing, going to monitor all your health needs and be the amazing destination site for everything that you wanted to know about your body. They did this in about kind of 2016, 17, I think. Until someone pointed out there was nothing about periods, nothing about the menopause, nothing about babies, nothing about childbirth, nothing about being pregnant, nothing. Why was that? Because there was not one single woman on the product design team, not one. So again, this stuff really matters. It matters for good business because you won't have as good a business. You won't be as creating as many different opportunities for your customers. But it also matters because we must change the power structures and the dynamics in our organizations to include people that have not had the same opportunities as us. So those are the questions I try and keep turning in my mind. We're working on things that matter. Are we using the tools of the modern age? And have we got the right people in the room? But as I say, don't tell everyone because then I really won't look very clever anymore. Thank you. Wow, that was incredibly wide ranging um, and uh, challenging actually. Um, it'd be good to pick up just a few of the themes and conversations. I'm Anthony Painter, by the way, I'm Director of Policy um, at CMI. Martha, I just want to talk a bit more about your your career, if that's okay, um, before we go into some of the, those. It's okay for me. Things. Might not be fine for them. Sleep. <laughs> um, I, I just the thing that sort of strikes me looking at your biography is is how many worlds that you've been a part of actually, um, tech, public service, um, policy, education, of course, business uh, now as well. And if you were to get your reflections, having been part of so many different worlds how they may come together better to resolve some of those big existential challenges that you were you were describing in your in your talk and what where there may be barriers to that sense of sort of collaborative spirit if you like yeah it's it's, it's such a fundamental question and we really keen to hear other people's views on this as well i think one of the things that i have enjoyed most and this probably sounds a bit strange and actually i found the most entrepreneurial experience of my life was setting up the government digital service in government in yeah. 2010 and then we created gov.uk 
And you might think, what is she talking about? How can that have been entrepreneurial? But actually trying to do something in government, you have to have a big ambition, which is kind of what you need in an entrepreneurial setting. You need to kind of bring people on the journey with you. And that was absolutely fundamental and because everyone was sitting there going, nope. So you have to kind of do the massive sales pitch and then you have to actually bake the product and do the thing, which is what we um, built uh, the, the new front end to government, which has been so um, incredibly powerful for us as a country and other countries have copied. Yeah. And I just give that as an example, because that was a place actually where we had different outside organizations helping in government. We were taking advice from lots of different places, but it was still way too hard to do. Yeah. And you still had to it was forced rather than it was a natural state. Yes. And I think that um, it's incredibly powerful when you can make it work between the public, private, and yeah. I guess uh, philanthropic sectors, but it's still, we don't create those environments enough. And I don't think business does it enough either, actually. You know, I'm president of the British Chambers of Commerce, and one of the things I've really been struck with uh, is this extremely strong and resilient local network. So we have 53 chambers around the UK and another 30 internationally, 100,000 businesses. It's big scale, but they're run as independent units and businesses. And so tying them together to make sure that what's happening in Doncaster is helpful to pool, is helpful to, you know, what the business businesses in Berlin might be facing is part of the, um, the uh, complexity of the organization but when it works it's amazing so one example is for trade for example so we don't trade enough in this country only one in ten businesses trade but it's actually one in six um, businesses of the British Chambers of Commerce and that partly happens because government and business and some charitable organizations come together to unlock some of those trading barriers so it does happen but it's too hard and we, we need to keep creating the conditions for it and it's hard to sustain it as well, just to, just to follow up. The thing about the government digital service, it made, you know, incredible strides in creating, you know, a, a unified system, very usable, good user experience and so on, but struggled to remain within the government yeah. structure and machine. And in, in the end, kind of sort of started to gravitate out, outwards. That's sort of, you're right. But I think the key thing actually is about leadership. It yeah. goes back to what we're talking about today. So... The reason that there's this, and it sounds kind of dry, but it wasn't actually, you took this absolute kind of cacophony of catastrophe of websites that the government was running, billions spent on them, no sense to us as the citizen, and created something, gov.uk, which, you know, I think all of us can safely say we've used reliably now and was so important during the pandemic. Yes. But that happened because of the incredible leadership of Mike Bracken and the team that were there. And they're never going to be in that central system for very long. So I think having ways that people can come in and out of different sectors to lead is a really important part of um, what, we're, what you're talking about in trying to unlock. So Mike came from the private sector and has now gone back to the private sector. He was in there for a bit, but that was hard to get that kind of flow going. And you need to keep bringing le different leaders in and give that different outside momentum. So hard, isn't it? I mean, I, I was reflecting as you were talking a few minutes ago around sort of purpose, values, mm -hmm. governance, leadership on those themes. And the, the, obviously the what we've seen happening at uh, Twitter, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the sudden this sort of landing from outer space of, of chat GPT, which, which in a sense, you know, every, anyone in the sort of AI world you know, realizes what, it, what it's about, but the rest of us suddenly mm -hmm. are now realizing what AI, and everything's getting real. But everything's suddenly happening, happening so fast. And the, the conversation is very theoretical around yeah. how you embed values in organizations and so on. But it's difficult to maintain that, isn't it? Yes, absolutely right. It is difficult. And, you know, you say people in the AI community knew chat was coming, generative technologies, sort of. Um, I was in hospital a lot last year, but from my, I'm quite tragic, from my hospital bed, I was watching a couple of conferences. And this was like summer last year, not very long before it hit the world. And I remember seeing Demis... Habibi Hasibi, sorry, uh, interviewed you started DeepMind, UK's big uh, global AI success story. I didn't even ask him about ChatGPT, and this was just a few months before it landed. So I think the point I take from that is that we're all going to have to work through much more ambiguity and uncertainty than we've ever had to. And that's just the tech piece, right? I mean, the climate catastrophe is the central challenge of our yeah. generation and decade. And unless we crack that, game over. I really do believe that. And one of the things that I've found so frustrating is the technology sector, which has so many of the tools that might help unlock us some of the problems that we're facing due to the climate catastrophe, is not engaging enough. They're still building CRM software. So, you know, I would say that we've got to reprioritize how we focus our time and what we're thinking about. And everybody should be thinking about 
their work and how that's going to contribute in the next decade. And it's bringing together technology and mindsets, isn't it? And that, that's the, you know, when we're talking about climate um, catastrophe, um, we we haven't had really had the get real moment yet no, in a way that that the AI is yes. is a bit of a get real moment. Yep, but we're okay. kind of it's very all very distant and theoretical. The most yeah, well, I, I would argue it's this, sorry to interrupt you. I would say it's distant and theoretical if you're living in London. I don't think it feels distant and theoretical if you're in the middle of uh, some bits of the continent of Africa or if you're sitting in the middle of Bangladesh. I mean, I think there are areas of the world that have felt it overwhelmingly. But we're the ones that yeah. have to change. No, that I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you. But we also we have to bring different people into the room to think about the answers. Yeah, it really one of the big organizations that I feel so lucky to have been involved in during my career is called CAMFED. And partly I was involved because one of my best friends runs it and they started it when we started lastminute.com and CAMFED was really early into the, realizing the economic power and importance of educating women and girls. This was before Michelle Obama, Rihanna and everybody was interested in it. This is when it wasn't fashionable. And I remember so well talking to my best friend Lucy on the phone once on Boxing Day and I was feeling a bit sorry for myself because I was in the basement of the lastminute.com office on Boxing Day stuffing tickets into envelopes. Something had gone wrong as always with the technology and there I was trying to sort it out with the fax machine. So I called Lucy and she's like, yeah, whatever. I have to go tomorrow to a village in the middle of um, Kenya where the chieftain is trying to kill the girls who are going to school. And I thought, okay, yes, be quiet, MLF. And I only tell that story because you know, it's so important to keep thinking about where the really important things that are happening in the world are. And she has done an incredible job at moving that organization from being run centrally here in London to owned and run by the women who've been through the system. So I think we've all got to think dramatically about how we bring different people into our conversations. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an exceptional point. And the, the, the question for me then is how we can have that conversation in an environment where, you know, our behaviors are influencing and impacting others um but we have to um change somehow in order to lean into these these fundamental global macro challenges yep. where you know, it, it, in the settings you've been in where have you seen those sort of mindset shift in ways that are helpful and what were leaders doing what were people on the ground doing how are they working together yeah, in order to see that those mindsets shift? i mean i'm not uh completely um Bonkers. I do realize that it's quite hard if you're sitting in an organization that is creating a product that may feel far remote from some of these existential things. But I think the point I make is that everybody can lead and lead with purpose. And I think that that is the defining difference, in my opinion, between people that are spectacular and people that do their jobs is those leaders that take on that wider responsibility of their impact in society and the organizational impact in society. I'll give you an example. I chair a company called We Transfer. It's a mid-sized tech company. I mean, people here have probably used their products, about 100 million users. It's a nice company. It's profitable. It was started in Amsterdam. It's not kind of hyper-growth, crazy, destroy everything, take over the world kind of company. And so um, the leadership in that team decided they were going to try and become a B Corp about five years ago. And they are now a B Corp, and they're probably one of the only technology-based businesses that has become a B Corp. And I'm sure people here know what the B Corp movement is about, but it's a very, very rigorous process of accreditation around lots of different metrics to do with climate, governance, inclusion, sustainability, all these things. And you have to keep recommitting to it every two years. So if you want to kind of cut through the greenwashing, then that is a really good way of telling whether people have. And that is a good example of a company that's doing a product that's a tech-based product for the creative community, but decided they wanted to pivot to a way to position themselves very firmly as wanting to subscribe to and deliver on this set of um, very, very tough KPIs around these important metrics. And any company, any organization can do that. Can You can make that decision. Yeah. It took a lot of work in the company, a lot of prep, a lot of time, but it was a really impressive um, process to see them go through. So what you seem to be articulating is it's not just possible to bring together values, inclusivity, business success, and leaning into big challenges. It's actually necessary. And I guess I guess the question is, is that interpretation right? And 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 how can we really, as a society, as organisations, individuals, stay the course? I don't think we have a choice. I mean, I think this is it's it's kind of keep adapting and keep learning or die. I really do believe that's true. I think that's true as an individual and I think that's true as organizations. And you only need to see, um, for example, you know, everyone's talking about, I don't like this expression, but like the war on talent, right? That we've got this million skills gap in this country. And we've talked about the managerial deficit um, in your introduction. And 
you know, I think that this is so fundamental about how we see ourselves and how we progress over the next decade. We, we have to um, reorganize ourselves around the, the right things and we have to lead with purpose. And we're already seeing it that with people coming into the workforce right now, they don't want to work for organizations that haven't stated what they are you know, doing to contribute to the world. And that's understandably, you know, I've got six year old twins of seven years old, right? They're gonna grow up in a wildly different world. The, the care of the planet and of people is so fundamental just to who they are, just naturally, not just because of me and my partner are. So I think that it is shifting and we've got to recognize that if we want to attract future talent and therefore you know, address this war on talent in quotation marks, that's just one angle, let alone customers demanding more and more and people on the other side of it. So. I don't think it's a choice. I think we it's a choice whether we are going to survive or not. Yeah. And the and the why and the how matter together, don't they? Well, yes. CMI, we have our professional standards and right at the core of those are uh, ethics and inclusivity. Yes. Because you might suppose that, you know, managers in everyday situation are like, I've got to get the job done, I've got to manage this project, I've got to manage my team, I've got to get my outcomes. But the context of this really matters. We can't yes. afford to ignore it matters as well. And we have to sort of collectively, in a formal way, actually, because people are reaching out. I think that there is a there is a willingness, desire, and appreciation of the necessities you're describing. But there might be a deficit in terms of actually how do we make this change yeah. and how do we align it with having an organisation that functions, whether it's a health service or yeah. a business or a startup, whatever it is. So all these things have to come together um, as 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 a practical set of responses, not just a set of aspirations, which are also important. I agree, and I don't underestimate the scale of the challenge, but I. And maybe this is the kind of luxury of always having been an entrepreneur. You know, I haven't really had a proper boss for a long time. And uh, I do think that everyone can think like an entrepreneur. I don't mean we're all, all entrepreneurial and should go off and start things. Some people should and probably need to be set free to do it. But everyone can feel agency in what they're doing and ask the right questions and encourage the people around them to ask the right questions. And being an entrepreneur, that's often just it, right? You're just pushing a bit more. You're just asking slightly more pr prickly questions and not accepting when people say no. And that, I think, is a universal. So I think there are lessons from entrepreneurship that people can take, even if everybody themselves doesn't think I'm the person to go off and start a new organization. Great. Well, I, I think we, we, we like to get practical. And so I, I guess, you know, wh whether it's thinking about climate catastrophe, whether it's thinking about inclusivity, whether it's thinking about the adoption of tech in the right ways, it's going to uh, enhance your organization and society, not just detract from it, because there could be some very corrosive adoptions of text. Yes. What are the practical things that, you know, that this group of managers, leaders online and beyond should start to think about doing sort of from today, yep. if not tomorrow? Well, I've shared with you my three questions and I would just keep reiterating them. You know, they are practical. They're things that you can act on. Are you working on something that matters? Can you justify this? Will you look back in 10 years and think this mattered? That, you know, that's easy to, to work through. Have we got the right people in the room? And I push people to think, have we got enough people that do not look like me? And I don't mean me, I mean all of you, right? If you're in a room with people that look and feel too much like you, that's not a good idea. So try and open the door to others and bring them into the conversation, whether from your customer group, from that wider stakeholders, from other places, that's something really you can easily just action. And then that piece about technology, play with it, use it, right? You're absolutely right, Anthony. I think the scales have fallen from everybody's eyes about AI because we've got something that feels like we can sort of understand it. It's not just this headline stuff. It's something you can sit and use and think, okay, now I can reimagine what I'm doing or what my life is like. I don't believe the world is going to end. I think we might all become much more productive. There's going to be some fallout, like every major industrial shift through time. But maybe it's going to lead to better work, better quality of work, more creative work. But we won't know that unless people engage with it. So get, keep learning. Make sure there are different people to yourself in the room. And make sure that you are pushing on whether you're thinking about the right problems. Brilliant. There we are. Three practical questions to take away and start tomorrow. Baroness Martha Lane Fox, I'm so, so grateful for you coming along today. Thank Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>